Welcome back vintage camera lovers. Now every story has a beginning and when it comes to digital cameras most of them start with the Apple QuickTape 100. Not only Apple's first digital camera but a model widely considered to be the first consumer digital camera from anybody. Terms and conditions apply. Launched in early 1994 at a price of around $750, the QuickTape 100 packed one third of a megapixel and a single megabyte of internal storage into a case that looked more like a small pair of binoculars with no screen for compositional playback. Almost three decades later, I snapped one up on eBay for £40 and took it to the streets of Brighton. So join me in rediscovering the birth of consumer digital photography and its often frustrating practicalities, especially today. But hold on to your horses. Casually claiming a birth or a first for anything involves caveats and the QuickTake 100 is no different. A variety of digital cameras had already been around for several years previously, even longer if you count the labs. But what made the QuickTake 100 claim its place in history was being the first consumer model costing under $1,000 and taking full color photos. It could even remember the images if your batteries ran out. Yet prior to this, spending a grand would get you something like a Logitech Photoman that stored black and white images in volatile memory, which meant they disappeared if you ran out of battery power. If you wanted full color images that stuck around along with any kind of meaningful control, you'd be spending a lot more on a professional camera at this time. Indeed, in the early years, the consumer and professional markets for digital cameras resulted in strikingly different products. At the high end, it was assumed pros would simply want a digital version of the film SLRs they were already familiar with. The first DSLRs typically adapted existing 35mm cameras, adding digital sensors where the film previously ran and bolting on battery packs and storage devices to make them work. In stark contrast though, the consumer market back then felt like the Wild West, embracing the concept that digital cameras didn't need to look anything like their analogue predecessors. I mean, just look at the QuickTake 100, more resembling a pair of binoculars, albeit with one eyepiece, and able to be held like binoculars too with both hands. Today, it looks more like a surveyor's tool rather than a stills camera, but back then it actually wasn't an uncommon design, with companies like Kodak adopting a similar approach for its consumer models for several years. Indeed, the QuickTake 100 was actually a collaboration between Apple and Kodak, with Kodak providing most of the electronics, including the sensor and lens, while Apple took care of the industrial design, the LCD user interface and the branding, which included their standard rainbow logo and Garamond typeface of the time. Now, that's not to say that Apple lacked the desire or ability to design their own imaging electronics, as the company's own advanced technology group had in fact been developing a more sophisticated camera in-house since the late 80s, but various decisions saw it later spun off into Flashpoint technology, which ended up powering a number of third-party cameras, including some from Kodak, Hewlett-Packard and Minolta. In contrast, the QuickTake 100 had a more urgent deadline in order to both capitalise on growing consumer demand and also to beat rivals to market, so they opted to go without an LCD screen for simplicity and to keep costs down. In use, you could grip the QuickTake 100 reasonably securely using your right hand only, with your thumb supporting the camera underneath, and at least two of your fingers resting over the somewhat substantial shutter release button. But the shape also naturally lent itself for two-handed support, like a pair of binoculars, and that's how I used it most of the time. If you prefer to mount it on some sort of stand, there's a tripod thread underneath. The camera itself is really simple. From the front, a sliding cover unveils the lens and powers the unit on, while sliding it back, switches it off again. You'll also notice a pair of small sensors flanking a larger circle, which is the front window for the optical viewfinder, the only means of composition on this camera. To their right is a built-in flash with a range of four to nine feet. The lens had a fixed focal length, equivalent to roughly 50mm, and a fairly modest closest focusing distance, which sadly ruled out selfies, at arm's length. For its successor though, Apple supplied a close-up adapter which clipped on the front. On the rear you'll find the optical viewfinder with a generous eye cup, although you will need to be looking straight through the optical axis for a clear view. Also be careful not to obstruct the main lens with your fingers or indeed anything else as you won't notice any obstructions through the viewfinder. Once again, composition is entirely with the optical viewfinder only, as while there is a small screen on the rear, it's for information and control only. It's a basic LCD which shows the total shots taken in the middle with the battery life below. 
Beware when the battery icon indicates half full as you won't have long left before that icon starts flashing and you're unable to take any more pictures. Icons in each corner of the screen indicate the only settings you can change using the buttons alongside them. Clockwise from top left is the flash mode, cycling between auto, forced on or forced off. Top right is the quality setting, toggling between standard and high resolution, with a number alongside indicating how many of them you can record in the remaining memory. If the camera is empty, you could record up to eight so-called high resolution photos or up to 32 in the lower quality standard mode. Lower right is the self timer and lower left is the delete button, wisely recessed and only pushable with the tip of say a pencil or paper clip. Wise because this button represented the nuclear option, deleting not just the last photo you took, but every single image in the camera. And remember, in the absence of a screen to review your images, you were effectively shooting blind and wouldn't actually see your shots until you had it connected to a computer later. I guess you could always carry a laptop with you to offload the images when the camera was full and you were out and about, but for most people, knowing you only had room for eight best quality photos and no chance of reviewing them in camera did at least encourage somewhat careful shooting. To be fair, while sub $1,000 cameras with screens did arrive soon afterwards, starting with the Casio QV10 series, I'm not aware of anything remotely affordable with a screen back in early 94. Also remember at this time, most people's photographic experience was with film, where you also wouldn't see your photos until they were developed long, long afterwards. So models like the QuickTake 100 were actually marketed as the faster option. On the right side of the camera, you'll find the battery compartment taking three double A's and happily working just fine with rechargeables and that makes it easy to power up today. That's about the only easy thing about it today though. Meanwhile, on the opposite side behind a sliding flap that neatly pushes inside the body are the two ports. One to provide external power from either an AC adapter or an optional battery pack that took eight double A's and the other one providing an 8-pin mini-DIN serial connection to a Mac or PC, as this was the only way to get images out of the camera's internal memory. Now, when the QuickTake 100 was first launched, it was unsurprisingly a Mac-only product supplied with a mini-DIN cable and software that worked with Mac desktops and PowerBooks of the day. Later that year, though, a Windows version arrived with a 9-pin D-sub serial cable and software for the Windows platform. For imaging, the QuickTake 100 employed a Kodak CCD sensor with an enormous one third of a megapixel, delivering photos with a maximum resolution of 640 by 480 pixels, or VGA for short. Once again, the modest internal memory could only accommodate eight of these best quality pictures, but if you wanted more, you could switch to standard mode, which reduced the size to 320 by 240 pixels, squeezing in up to 32 in total. To compare their quality, I photographed Brighton Pier using both modes, starting here with the high resolution 640x480 image, which I'll zoom into for a closer look at the outstanding degree of detail. I'll keep this version on the left and now introduce the standard 320x240 version on the right. Yeah, they weren't exactly pretty, but remember a 640x480 VGA photo was already wider than most websites in the mid 90s. In fact, it could fill the screen of most PC monitors. And it also had sufficient resolution to be reproduced a couple of inches wide, making it adequate for listing papers with a fast turnaround. Once your memory was full though, that was it. If you absolutely needed to record more images while out and about, and you didn't have a laptop to empty the camera onto, you had to push that trash can button and erase the entire lot, almost like a Defender smart bomb. Today, getting on for three decades later, one of the most challenging aspects of using the QuickTake 100 isn't the modest quality, the lack of memory or inability to review the images, no, 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 but actually getting those photos out of the device in the first place. Like other cameras with built-in memory and a serial connection, you'll need to track down the original software that talks to the camera, find a computer that can run it, and which crucially also has an appropriate physical interface for the cable. Now, had the QuickTake 100 alternatively offered a TV output, you could have captured that signal, but here it was serial or nothing. The original QuickTake software for both Macs and PCs is actually fairly easy to find on archives, but sadly I couldn't get it to run properly under emulation on modern systems, nor communicate with the camera using a USB to serial port adapter. 
Now your mileage may vary in this respect, especially as emulators are improving all the time. But my only option at the time that I made this video was to find a more age appropriate computer from a similar era in the mid to late 90s. In the end, I found two. I tracked down an old Mac PowerBook 165 laptop with 180 electronics inside from eBay for 60 quid. And I built my own new Windows 98 system using a circa year 2000 motherboard with a serial port and a compact flash card pretending to be an IDE hard disk. And here's the PowerBook talking to the camera using an original quick take cable lent me by a friend. And here's the Windows 98 system using a serial cable that I bought from eBay, links below. Since the PC had more modern connectivity, it was easier for me to access the actual images once they'd been copied across. But even then, there's a final gotcha, as the QuickTake 100 doesn't simply record its photos as JPEG files. Oh no, that would be way too easy. Instead, it records them using a proprietary QTK format, which of course modern software knows nothing about. Luckily, the QuickTake software for both Macs and PCs will allow you to export images from the camera in more future-friendly formats, including JPEGs from the Windows version. And both versions of the software will even allow you to remote control the camera and shoot with it tethered if you like. Let me know if you'd like me to make a separate video all about the computers, cables and software that I use to talk to the QuickTake 100 in the modern day, although it was such a frustrating experience, the language may be somewhat fruity. But now, I feel we're more than overdue for my traditional slideshow of images taken around Brighton over several sessions this time, since I could only record eight best quality pictures at a time. Oh, and there's mercifully no video samples coming up as this kind of feature was way beyond the technology at the time. Okay, see you in a moment. Thanks for sitting through that and not clicking away. Now, I like to be respectful about all the vintage gear that I review here, but the fact is using the QuickTake 100 in the modern day proved to be the most frustrating experience I've had on this channel to date, packed with caveats and catch-22s. Now, the camera itself is simple enough to use and I welcome any vintage device that's easily powered today by AA batteries, but the limited capacity coupled with an inability to review images or delete anything other than the entire lot in one go just makes it impractical for anything beyond a historical curiosity. Plus that's before you even jump through the hoops required to actually get the images out of the camera. And once you do and you start looking at them, well, the photo quality is pretty basic to say the least. If you're after a vintage digital camera experience that's much easier to use in the modern day, I'd recommend skipping ahead a few years. To be fair, at the time, the biggest criticism was actually the limited capacity, and that was addressed one year later with the mildly updated QuickTake 150, which could double the number of shots. No, not by doubling the internal memory, as some reported at the time, but by simply employing stronger compression. And early adopters of the original 100 model could send their cameras in for an update, although you did have to pay. The QuickTake 150 was also supplied with a close-up adapter that clipped over the front, finally allowing handheld selfies to be in focus. But by this time, the market was evolving very quickly, and while many new cameras still relied on internal memory and proprietary serial cable connections, most now also sported screens for composing and reviewing images, along with AV outputs to TVs, which are much easier to capture today. 
Casio's QV10 led the charge in a flood of cameras with these capabilities. Apple responded with their third and what would become their final dedicated camera, the QuickTake 200. Developed with Fujifilm this time, it was essentially a rebranded version of the DS8, sporting a color screen and removable smart media memory cards. But Apple as a company was struggling at this point and once Steve Jobs returned a year later, his first move was to streamline the product range, cancelling lines including the QuickTake cameras and the Newton PDAs to concentrate on their core strength of computers. So that marked the end of the QuickTake story. While Apple only produced three dedicated QuickTake cameras, all of which were essentially rebranded Kodak or Fujifilm models, it still has the claim of kickstarting the consumer digital camera market back in the mid 90s. And ironically, it can also be credited as being pivotal in their downfall decades later, when the imaging capabilities of the iPhone became sufficiently good for most people to dump their point and shoot cameras. In fact, the iPhone has since become the most successful and popular series of digital cameras to date, if you can class it as such. As for the QuickTake 100, it certainly deserves a position in every serious vintage collection as one of the most important early models to be released, but actually using it almost three decades later after launch is really only for the techno masochists out there. The effort to reward ratio is one of the worst that I've experienced, although I'm relieved that I did manage it in the end. After all, as a former PCW editor, I couldn't let it beat me, right? So tell me, did you own or use any of the Apple QuickTake cameras back in the day? Or even more bravely, are you still shooting with one today? As always, I'd love to hear from you in the comments, not just about this series of cameras, but also to share your first experiences with any digital cameras. And if you enjoy these retro reviews and would like to see more of them, remember the best way to support me is to simply like them, subscribe to this channel, and check out as many of my other videos here as possible. Thanks for watching, thanks for your support, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.